Okay. So with Flags of Our Father and now with this film, why did you feel it was important to show both sides of the war? Well, I, uh, I, think it's, uh, if, uh, I think it's always interesting to get as many angles and as many uh, various looks on, on any, uh, any subject matter you can. To, to, and, and in order to understand our uh, involvement in World War II and, and, uh, and, and especially a, a battle as ferocious as the battle for Iwo Jima was, you kind of have to understand the other side and understand uh, what, what their mentality is, the kind of culture that we were uh, up against and the kind of uh, uh, tenacity that was, was put out there. Uh, I kind of uh, figured if, uh, if, if the Battle of Iwo Jima is the biggest battle the Marine Corps ever had, and uh, so there must be a reason for that battle. Uh, uh, there must be a reason for that difficulty. And uh, so, uh, and the reason is uh, General Kurobayashi, who uh, was a modernist uh, in, by Japanese standards in those days, and he d devised the idea of tunneling through the island and defending it that way, having the island linked up by tunnels. And, and so the Americans had no idea how many people were there, where they were stationed, what have you. So he made a very tough battle out of it. And, um, uh, most of the Marines that I've talked to, uh, who were there, uh, all uh, remarked that the, all the time they were coming on the beach, they, they never saw the enemy. They were there, and some of them were on the island for uh, w weeks at a time and never saw an enemy. So it was all kind of a hidden type deal. So I was just wondering what kind of man this uh, this general was, and what kind of uh, men that he. he uh, that he commanded, uh, and uh, what kind of a culture it was that could live like that, live like animals in the ground kind of thing. And he, uh, so I read a small book that he had written, with, which had sketches, which he written to his daughter and his son um, in 1928 when he was an envoy in the United States. And he learned English over at Harvard and Boston and, uh, and we traveled around this country extensively. And it just seemed like he enjoy, was enjoying the trip uh, and uh, making the best of it. But he, he seemed like a very sensitive person who was conscious of his uh, family and missed his family very much. And I felt, yeah, that's the same way I'd feel. That's the same way every father feels. And uh, so uh, we, we started writing a story or uh, uh, we, we, we hired a young lady to write a story and she wrote a very good script. And so we just decided to tell it from that side as well, see if we could show that culture and that mentality. Because it's a little bit different than, than our side uh, in the sense that uh, we, they were uh, people who, uh, who were told to go defend an island and don't plan on coming back. It's a tough sell. I know that, I mean, like between our soldiers and the soldiers that you researched in Japan, did you find that the mentality was very different? Because you just said the government basically said, hey, you're not coming back, whereas we had a little bit of hope. But did you find their mentality was different? Uh, well, the, the mentality today is, is, is much like ours. Uh, everybody, but that's what the way it was then. And because uh, Japan was under the, the uh, leadership of, of a very strict military regime at that time, and so they were, yeah, they were told they were just go out there and, and hold on. And, uh, and I guess uh, you could do that in almost any culture if you had to, but you, you wouldn't exactly look forward to it. Uh, one thing that made American soldiers great, in, uh, especially in World War II, and is that there's, they always have a lot to lose. Americans have a lot to lose because we have a democratic society a lot, and uh, we have, um, a, a free society, uh, but they uh, they were in a different period of time then, and uh, now they're different because since the war, Japan's become an, uh, an enormous uh, economy and a democracy, a very powerful democracy. In directing Japanese actors, did you find the language barrier to be a huge obstacle, or how did you approach it? Uh, no, I didn't find it an obstacle. I, I found that. Uh, I found it uh, f fun to do, actually, because uh, 
Uh, I'd had a little experience with it, only as an actor years ago. I'd worked in a few pictures when I was doing films in Italy and in uh, Spain, where, it, where other people would speak different languages. And I'd speak English, somebody else would speak Spanish, somebody else would speak Italian, Austri uh, German, what have you. Uh, so, but really that, that didn't have any effect on it because good acting is good acting. Bad acting, bad acting, and uh, good actors, uh, uh, it, you could tell the difference in this, and no matter what the language is. All right, my time's up. Thank you. I appreciate it. Your time's it. up. It's up already. It goes by so fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll okay, end okay. when it ends. It ends when it ends. Okay, okay. Let's let's do this again. Okay. okay. This is. Okay. I run out of material and out of. Okay, wait, what's it? Oh, so I know that you actually filmed a lot of the the movie on Iwo Jima. Was the Japanese government receptive when you said you wanted to come in and do this movie? Yeah, I, w I went and visited them first uh, a few years ago when I was preparing uh, the, with the idea of doing Flags of Our Fathers, and I was actually doing, doing it with the idea that I would go and film on Iwo Jima, that particular film, and, uh, and it, would be, it would entail uh, it reinvading the whole island, practically, because the, the, the invasion was huge. It was 880 ships and thousands and thousands of men, and uh, I thought, uh, says we could at least do part of it there and do something but the and the and the, uh, the mayor of Tokyo the governor they call him but he it's under his uh, jurisdiction the island and he said uh, yeah it's very interesting you know but I could tell it was a slight reticence because they do feel because they still have somewhere between 10 and 12,000 unaccounted for yeah. people that were buried into the ground there that they uh, they call they think of the island as a memorial, and so the, and they have several memorials on it. One for the United States Marine Corps, and the other for uh, the Japanese military that were there. So uh, they uh, they were a little bit reticent. So I said, well, look, maybe we'll come and we'll do some just m less severe things, and we'll find another place to do the uh, the actual uh, invasion. So we for for, for flags we went to. Uh, we went to Iceland, uh, which is a uh, sounds like an odd choice, but Iceland is a, a geothermal island with black sand, very much like Iwo, and it's very stark in certain places. Made a very good double for it. So we were shooting in the summer uh, in, uh, in Iceland and uh, to duplicate February in uh, Iwo. Last week, Hilary Swink told me that you told her, with films, you always aim for a bullseye, and sometimes you make it, and sometimes you don't. So with you, how do you know when you've created a masterpiece, when it's really great? Is there something in your gut that tells you? I don't know. I don't know all that. I just, uh, all the, you just try the best you can on everything uh, you do. Uh, some stories are more appealing than others. Uh, the, the main thing is uh, you just uh, go through. You get, a, you get a proper story that you think is, is good and you cast it properly. You're, some people think if you're, you cast it really well, you're 90% there. And uh, the, qu the rest is organizational and, uh, and sort of organic as you're putting it together. But um, I, I don't know. I just, you just go by what your feelings are. It's what it comes out like is still your feelings. It doesn't have anything to do with other people's perception. Other people have to, it has to be perceived by the audience in a, in a positive way uh, for them to want to attend it. And um, those are things you have no control over anyway. So you just have to only go from your perspective on out. That's oh. all you can do. How much is Letters is based on actual soldiers? I know that you read the General's Diaries, uh -huh. but there's also the sub-stories with the, with the soldiers. So how much of it is? Well, a lot of the, uh, uh, al almost the g a vast majority of it are, uh, uh, are uh, real people. Uh, there's a few fictional characters that have been devised to guide uh, through, but uh, but there there are are characters that are very similar in uh, in their activity uh, of of real people. Uh, Baron Nishi, who was on the island, who um, won the gold medal in the equestrian event in 1932 in Los Angeles, uh, the 1932 Olympics. He uh, 
he uh, is, a, is a real character who was there, and uh, he was a close friend of Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, Cy Bartlett, all these people. He, was, he stayed in California for a while and was part of that equestrian crowd. And he was a very flamboyant, uh, world-savvy guy. And then there was a bunch of other people, too. Uh, the, the Lieutenant Edu, all, all of them, all of them have, uh, have character, they were characters on the island for the most part. Okay, now my time really is up. Uh. Okay.